I am Andres Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom, a meeting of the Language of Wisdom study group with uh, Jerry Northrup, led by Jerry Northrup, uh, with me also. Uh, we're trying to bridge our languages of wisdom. Jerry, um, if you've seen the video about uh, Udodu, is, um, uh, has a language, the relational symmetry paradigm, and I have wondrous wisdom. And we're looking for how to bridge that. So what I'm trying to do is to delve into Jerry's um, personal knowledge of eco-technology uh, through 60 years of examples, um, where he has uh, theoretically and practically uh, figured things out. So I my goal is to collect 50 examples. We'll see. Maybe today we'll get 10 or so. We'll see. So that's the that's what we're doing today. Uh, I'll share my screen. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Andreas. So here is uh, the Language of Wisdom sub-wiki at the mathforwisdom.com uh, website. And over here, uh, this is Jerry's section, Ecotechnology, and this is my section, Wondrous Wisdom. And here's Bridging Our Languages. So we're going to go straight to here. Epistemological Portrait of Jerry Northrup. So we're here. And a couple examples, I'll maybe insert them uh, here. Um, and this is where a back porch was screened in and a colony of bees uh, and how he got those bees to go out of the screen as opposed to uh, the other way around. <laughs> and then the grass flies, how they became a source of amusement. Um, and so I have a list of prompts for examples, uh, quite abstract. And so maybe I'll just go through them, Jerry, and. Um, will record examples you have. Uh, but maybe you have some ideas uh, right away um, of how are things, you know, how did you figure things out in eco-technology? Yeah, I think the, uh, what you had said before for the examples that you wanted some more concrete instances to to do it. So uh, I will think about those and, and get them up uh, so that, that you could get them recorded uh, in terms of, of what you got here, the field of dreams, if you build it, they will come. Uh, <clears throat> that goes goes back to specific examples of how you set up a, uh, a biological system, a large ecological system, and then you look for what, uh, what shows up in that. And I can do a, an example there in terms of... Um, When you grow microbial biomass and you're going to use it as, as food, one of the kind of things you think of is earthworms, because earthworms basically eat microbes in the soil and, and they go. But there are a series of, of aquatic worms called oligocates that live in water and do the same kind of thing. They basically uh, eat microbes and, and what have you, and then they do that. So what happened was I used to see when I was out poking around these big uh, biological systems with biad. Occasionally you'd see a stream where there would be a little uh, reddish area on the bank of the stream. And it turns out that would be a small worm ball of these oligocates. And when I was working with the wastewater treatment plant, uh, we started to look at, at the variety of other things that, that lived there. And if you take an Ekman dredge and you go down in one of these mixed liquor channels and you bring up uh, some of the uh, sediment on the bottom, I found that there were a lot of, of um, oligocate worms in that. And you could rinse off the solids and you could literally get a ball of oligocate worms. They would stay together and you could hold it in your hand. It was this wiggling thing that held together because the worms all stayed together. So the notion then is that's a very interesting uh, food source. So how do we build a system which mimics an environment where they would like to live? And so that is one of the big things we're looking for with, with timberfish is how you set up a system where you can feed it uh, a biomass, a microbial biomass, and the worms are there in small concentrations, but that they have a specific environment that they really can colonize, then they grow into these large aggregates of, of, uh, of oligocate worms that are very easy to harvest. 
had to clean off and then fill in the, in the fish tank. So that that is one kind of example of, of that sort of philosophy. The second one has to do with uh, a project. I had an intern, Jeremy Smith, from SUNY Fredonia, who worked with us. And he was interested. I gave him a series of possible projects, and one of which was involved uh, freshwater snails. I had done previous work where I had observed uh, some of the little woodland ponds that I developed uh, and I put trout in, that you look at what they were eating, they were eating these snails. Uh, you could find them if, if you dissected them and look into the gut, there, there'd be snail shells. And that was a surprise to me. And the snails would live on the plants, uh, things like watercress and anything that has a root structure down along the side of the pond. And the fish would come and they would harvest those. So we thought, how do we um, make use of that? So the notion was uh, that Jeremy came up with, which is very uh, innovative, was to build a small device, which was about a, oh, a foot and a half by foot and a half, which is a plastic uh, uh, sheet. And we built a little structure which hold that at a slight angle, uh, I don't know, 15 degrees or 20 degrees or something like that. And then take water from our system, uh, water from the bioreactor, say, and then run it across this uh, inclined sheet and then let it drop back into the, uh, into the bioreactor. And if you do that, it turns out these snails would uh, attach themselves to this plastic sheet. And then they would uh, deposit egg masses on the plastic sheet. And then the eggs would develop and then they would turn into adults and they would go. So what we would do would set up a screening device at the end so that uh, small snails could go through, but a few large snails would not so that you maintain a breeding population on this little worm device and you fed a constant stream of these uh, small snails into the bioreactor or into your fish tank. And if they go into the fish tank, they would attach themselves to the side and keep the sides of the tank clean. And then certain kinds of fish would eat those, catfish in particular, uh, smallmouth bass to some extent, or largemouth bass to some extent. So that's another situation where you look at um, what is there in a natural environment, how that could be useful and what you're trying to do. And then you build a little device, a selection procedure uh, to, uh, to, to basically make a comfortable place for them to live and to grow and, and to reproduce to the levels where they became a useful food source or, or something like that you could do. Uh, so there are quite a number of specific instances like that. Uh, so well, those uh, are, and these are exactly the kind of things that uh, I'm collect, you know, collecting from you. So this is perfect. Yeah, that's, that's a concrete example of yeah, that. Yeah, they're very concrete. And, and uh, uh, they're concrete in the sense of the logic is concrete. Like, so it's not so crucial to know, like, what continent this was on or what decade this was. Right. You know, it doesn't have to be concrete in that way. But it's concrete in terms of the the logical situation, and so um, to go back and to focus on the figuring out part, right? So field of dreams is kind of like a shorthand, but it can stand for many things. But right. one of the things in the first example was that um, you had an artificial environment, like an you had a, a, a yeah, an ecosystem, yeah. an ecosystem where you know humans had kind of intervened let's say and designed right yeah. and so um it's kind of crucial there you weren't hunting for things in nature as such you were looking at this uh very particular um semi-artificial uh ecosystem and what you were figuring out was like well almost like an inventory or just um an observation like what do you have you know what's out there right is that right and so you right. 
you came upon those worms. I mean, or you noticed simply, like you noticed um, what's interesting. Maybe that's not oh, what it is. Yeah, this, this to goes back to that specific example. I first became aware of the existence of oligocates from the experience of the wastewater treatment plant, which was this artificially constructed environment. Mm -hmm. Later on, when I started really working with large- well, Hold on, let's just do it piece by piece because, so in that first case, like how did you notice that or what happened? Like how did you become uh, aware? Uh, well, what we did is, is I was basically in charge of the lab. I started with the, the town of Amherst as a chemist and then took over as their process superintendent. Mm -hmm. But we had all of this stuff. And one of the things we had a, a series of microscopes and we took a look at the flock structure of the bacterial. Some of them form chains and some of them form balls and some of them are single cells. And what size so are these? Just so that I, these are... Um... These are our, our bacterial organisms. They're roughly a micron. Okay, they're tiny. So they're really microscopic. I yeah, see very, very, very small. Uh, but you can see them with a phase contrast microscope mm -hmm. uh, so that you could look. Well, the micron started, would be like the width of a hair? Is that? Oh, much smaller than that. Oh, okay. It's smaller than that. Yeah. I'll set up a, a thing with a relative. It's roughly 10 to the minus 10 meters. I okay. believe that's a micron. Uh, I have to check. That's more like that. a nanometer, probably. Like that's like a, a atom, I think. Oh, yeah, I think no, no, a nanometer is, is smaller than that. I don't know. I, okay. I, I, anyway, so the, we have the to. We have to on. But anyway, so we would start to look, and then you you started to see, well, there were all kinds of protozoa mm -hmm. there that that were attached themselves to the surface of the clarifier, um, or. Uh, the wall of a, of a bioreactor or a surface like that. And there would be all kinds of crazy things. There would be stalked organisms, which had a long stalk with a bell, then flagella that would swirl around and cause the bacteria but, to go. Through and they would just, to, just, to slow it, just to slow it down, because I'm really trying to get the motivations for the figuring things out. Like, why, why did you notice these things? Why were you? Well, it was a basic uh, a curiosity of you've got this big working system, this wastewater right. treatment, and the, the engineering notion that this is all bacterial, this is a biological system, you're using bacteria. Uh -huh. And you say, oh, well, it looks like there's more stuff going on here than just bacteria. Okay, so let's stop so right there. Like, so when you say it so looks like there's up. more stuff, like where did that come from? It looks like there's more stuff. Well, it, it comes from just... You know, being a woodsy birdsy as a kid, and you go around in the, in the woods and you look at stuff, and then you find if you look more closely, there's more detail now. Sure. And if you follow that down, you find that there's this tremendous world out there that most of us just are totally unaware of. Okay, but now uh, in the context of your job there, where did you, what, what was the situation there where you said, I think there's more here than just bacteria? Well, it was just a general curiosity as to how this thing really works, because the job specified there's engineering things, uh, mm -hmm. process control configurations like the uh, food to biomass ratio, F to M ratio, mm -hmm. that you want to control in a certain thing. So what is the food? Well, it's biomass. What is the biomass? It's bacteria. And what do the bacteria look like? How many different forms? Because the bacteria would form a flock, sometimes it rises to the surface, sometimes it sinks. Why does it do different things? So you start to look at it. Okay, and so just just to, just to I'm just keeping slowing down because this is really a lot of content and very valuable. So the flock goes up to the surface, right? Is that you're saying? So sometimes in a wastewater plant with these bacterial biomasses, uh, sometimes you get what they call process upsets. And it has to do with oxygen concentrations and what's coming in if somebody dumps it. Okay, and so, so how do you notice a process upset? Well, you, you get an upset. All of a sudden, you've got a lot of solids coming to the surface, but they shouldn't be settling to the bottom. They go over the weir and they contaminate your effluent, and that's a problem. So you and say, how do you notice I... that? How do you notice that? I'm just, just to be concrete. Uh, it, it's pretty obvious. See, we, we would always analyze chemically our effluent. So you on a daily on basis or on a... on a daily basis. And actually, we would set up um, samplers so that we just sample it every hour or every half hour. You okay, so like that's a, and just to just to just to clarify what I'm doing, like 
see, that's a very important way of figuring things out. Like, you know, so you do like, and this is obvious to you, but it's like not obvious to me. That's what I need to kind of catch on. So you're doing right. um, like every hour or every day you're doing different tests. Is that right? Yeah, you set up samplers. And again, I, I had a, a big lab. We had, I don't know, three, four people working there. Mm -hmm. We did all kinds of tests. And this was to make sure that the plant ran well. And, okay. and those tests those tests are on water in different locations in the... Water in, the in solids. And, and solids. And you can find that. So you've got a lot of this chemical data. What's the nitrogen content? What's the phosphorus content? What's and, called BOD, biological oxygen demand? Okay, and so every day, and I'm almost trying to translate, but so you're taking samples on a regular yep. basis, and you're examining the samples, you're running different right. tests on them to understand um, changes in content. Like you're you're recording the content, right? Like you know what's right. the, what you're finding, right? Recording findings. Yes. It's a, okay, it, just so it, that mm -hmm, that's a grab bag of things, but at least that's very important. That's right. of course very natural, so it needs to be included. I cut you yeah. off, okay, and so. Uh, but you would also, I think also there's like visual inspection. Is that right? Like, oh, you know, yeah. oh. what, so how does visual do? inspection work? You collect all of this analytical data. Mm -hmm. You do that regularly. But then I used to walk through the plant every day. I'd get in there early in the morning and I'd walk through. I'd take an hour, an hour and a half and go through. You look at everything and you see, how does it appear? What does it smell like? What does it sound like? What is the effluent? Is it is it clear? Can you see the bottom of the chlorine contact tank or not? Then you go back and you look at the lab data and you say, well, what's different? How did it change? Why is this a good day? Why is this a bad day? Then you go back and you look at, at how the clarifiers are functioning. And normally a clarifier, you put a biomass and liquid in it mm -hmm. and you settle out. The solids go to the bottom and the clean water goes over a, a weir at the top. That's the way it's supposed to function. Sometimes you go out, you look at it, and you find solids up at the top. And they're going over the weir, and they make the effluent dirtier, and then you have a problem with not making permit. And so, so here again, like you have a, and so all these are like, you know, I'll be able to sit through this video and see what, you know, and sort it out. And then we'll have more videos where we get it more refined. But the idea being that, um, uh, you know, on the one hand, you have these procedures that are very um, mechanical and analytic and almost robotic. Yeah. But then on the other hand, like you have as a personal steward, you are walking every day. And if you need to a couple times a day, like you are doing, and then you're comparing those two. That's a third method, right? right? And yeah. then you have like an understanding of how things regularly are. And then you have an understanding of what's anomalies and you're right. making those. Okay. So this is all like very obvious to you, but we're just recording this. Okay. Right. Yeah. And so then uh, the question was, so, so when did you notice about these, um, bundles of worms right like when did that first catch your eye like how did that work uh that worked i mean we were we were starting and i became aware of all this stuff going on in the in the uh in the wastewater treatment plant that weren't part of the engineering descriptions is what you're supposed to do so i started to look what is really there mm -hmm. uh, what can we find uh, looking in the in the in the actual um physical um yeah uh, reservoirs or, or whatever these uh these storage yeah. units right like okay you were looking there visually yes and and we had hired a uh a, a chemist to to work in the lab and she was very interested in in uh the invertebrates mm -hmm. that go along and so she said well there's all these things is that we had the microscopes i said so look could Take samples and let's see what's there. See if take we can samples make samples of water. Take, take samples of water or take samples of, of the water and of the solids. Oh, and uh, the solids. Kind of, I see. Yeah, any kind of thing. If you've got some solids that are floating to the surface, take those. They look mm -hmm. like the same as, as the solids that settle to the bottom. Mm -hmm. It turns out they don't. The ones that come to the surface have long filaments. The mm -hmm. ones that go to the bottom tend to be more globular. Mm -hmm. So you you look at those kinds of things, and you look at the other other protozoa and other uh, invertebrates that impact with that microbial biomass, and, and you see this huge spectrum. I mean, it's like going into a forest, and you see all these different kinds of animals. Only when you go into a forest, I don't know, there may be 
20 or 30 different kinds of animals, you start looking at this treatment plant and there are thousands of different kinds of, of organisms there that are living on this biomass. Okay, and, and how do you it. notice how do you notice those thousands of organisms? You you look at it. You you look with a microscope and you see something. You say, "What's this?" Okay, so that's so, that's from the regular samples you get. You 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 look for organisms within those samples, right? Right. It's not part of what a lot of wastewater treatment plants do. Mm -hmm. It's what we did because we were curious about uh, how this really functioned, and and to build that kind of an understanding. And when you do that, then you get so that you can control it. So we we really put out holy water most of the time. Uh, literally, you could look at the at the chlorine contact tank at the end of the treatment plant under eight feet of water. You can see the bottom really clearly. Mm -hmm. and I, put, I put a plate with uh, the town seal on it and then a, a dime, a nickel, a quarter to 50 cent piece in the corners. Mm -hmm. And if it was working really well, you could look down through eight feet of water and you could tell whether they were heads or tails of this uh, plate. Oh, wow. Well, that's impressive. So that and, so, and so, but that's another way of figuring things out, like to be able to right. have these, to set up these kind of like uh, visual tests, right? Like, yeah. So that you could tell by taking a look, is this plant working well or not? And, and so quality control in this kind of way, you know, in visual quality control. Right, like right. you know, it's kind of like reach this kind of a self check, right? Like, yeah. does it look? Yeah, and yeah. if it's a little cloudy and you can't see the bottom of that clearly, you say, okay, something's wrong. They just start to go and look. Why mm -hmm. is it different today? What's happened? Is it somebody dumped something upstream and we got it the influent? Is it something uh, an equipment failure? Is it uh, a recycle flow that needs to be changed or what have you? We have all of these different variables that you could do. Uh, with a base wastewater treatment plant, does it need more oxygen? Does it need less? Uh, and you you correlate that, and, and the realization was is that this is a very complex, detailed ecosystem. It's not just bacteria, and it's a, a system that changes every day because your influence changes every day. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. so you, mm -hmm. the, the more you can understand about that, the better you can operate the system. And so to go back to the story about the bundle of worms, uh, how did you first learn about those bundles of worms? Well, we sampled, we knew that we had these distribution channels where the uh, the wastewater was mixed with a biomass in a bioreactor and then it was distributed to clarifiers to separate the solids mm -hmm. from the liquids. You recycle the solids back to the bioreactor. So mm -hmm. we had this long channel. It was, I don't know, 12 feet deep. It was aerated. It was uh, 200 feet long mm -hmm. and vigorous aeration. So we looked at that because we were concerned about occasionally you got these floating solids. We took an Ekman dredge and, and dropped it down in and, and collected some sediment from the bottom. See what's what's there. How much sediment is building up at the bottom? Mm -hmm. Is this causing a problem? We brought it up and we said, <laughs> that's full of worms. Okay, so and so here's a case where like you do maintenance, you do cleaning, you do like and see you learn by accident, like you know, it's almost accidental in a certain sense. Yeah, some of but it's but simply the, the, the there's these processes of uh, upkeep that expose you to interesting things. Is that right. that seems natural okay. in uh, this type of environment, right? Like you know that the maintenance pro processes yeah. are very instructive. Or uh, to give you an example of that kind of thinking of, of the discovery of penicillin, mm -hmm. that was discovered because they were working with with bacteria in a laboratory and stuff like that. And they had a bunch of old petri dishes. Petri dishes are, I don't know, five inches, six inches in diameter, little things mm -hmm. you put agar, a food substrate, and then you inoculate some bacteria on it. You see what grows up and mm -hmm. you'd get a bacterial film over the top. So after you've done that, you know, then you basically dispose of those. Well, they took a whole bunch of them and they set them aside uh, on the thing and they didn't get around to throwing them away. And somebody looked at it and found that some of them, um, all the bacteria had, had died. Mm -hmm. and they said that they found somewhere that there were holes where the bacteria were, were dying. And they said, what's causing that? Mm -hmm. And they discovered that they were contaminated with this uh, uh, fungus penicillium that was secreting 
an antibacterial agency, and that's where penicillin was discovered. It was an accident mm -hmm. by just looking at your environment and what you're doing beyond the specific scope of a defined experiment. It's mm -hmm. looking at what you clean up and, and that sort of thing. See, another example. Looking at side effects, so to speak, like, like yeah. looking at the side effects. Yeah. Okay. And then thinking through, like, what's interesting about the side effects. Right. Right. See, one of the things I was looking at uh, when I was a graduate student was uh, mutation. We were growing spore-forming bacteria, and I was looking at mutagenic agents to try and determine what triggered the sporulation. Mm -hmm. you have, grow up a colony or a whole culture, a, a flask full of bacteria, and they get up to where they run out of food, and then they all form spores. And we say, what is the genetic trigger? Is that a little episode, a little piece of DNA that does that or what have you? Mm -hmm. So we were looking at different chemical agents that would do that. And as part of that, you know, you, you'd be pipetting samples and, and growing this stuff and looking for mutations. And I would find that sometimes um, when I would pipette the control, which was distilled water, onto a plate, which shouldn't grow anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would find that I were getting organisms on the plate. There was contamination coming from somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I started to look and, and found a couple of sources. One, the soap we used in the lab was something called malachite greed, mm -hmm. which had a similar chemical structure to one of the substance I was looking at as a mutagenic agent called acroflavin. And I said, could that be that the soap we are using is actually a mutagenic agent that is causing uh, mutated bacteria, which is getting in and, and changing the experiment? Hmm. And it does seem to be that was the case. Another one was that we would you use the auto you use the pipettes, which is a long tube of glass that you can pick up very mm -hmm. calibrated quantities of liquid to see how much how many bacteria are in it. And then you put them into a big tank and, and wash them, and then you uh, autoclave them, uh, which was a heat and pressure, which is supposed to kill all the spores and everything like that. And I was getting some things that looked like they were coming through the autoclave process. So I was thinking, what's that? And I discovered that if you heat spores um, to 120 degrees um, centigrade, Mm -hmm. for a period of time, that will cause mutations in the spore. So when the spore germinates, it is no longer, doesn't have the same exact DNA because it would have mm -hmm. mutations in it. So that's, a, again, where you're doing experiments and you look at your whole system, including how you set it up, how you clean up afterwards, mm -hmm. and what have you. And when you find things that are... Uh, unexpected, that's an exciting thing because then you say something else is going on and you go look for it. That's and, and so that's uh, it's that's the crucial thing about getting to talk with you is to be able to chase down your motives. You see, because a lot of this, you could say, oh, like, you know, it's one thing to read about it, but it's another thing to kind of realize, okay, but why was Jerry doing this? You see, and it turns out that then your whole value system becomes part of it. Right. Like, you know, that right. like you're saying, you're not just interested in cleaning the water. You're interested in understand how things work. You're understanding right. to know, like, what the universe is like. You're understanding exactly. and how these things talk to each other. You see. And so uh, the fact that your mind is in a different place yields a uh, different uh, whole epistemology. And that's what we're trying to chase down. So we're doing that. Right. And so yeah. I wanted to ask, uh, would you be free to, if we did another session of this? Because it's very helpful. I don't know if you're available today or you want to go in a week or. Uh, yeah, I can. Let me take a, a look to see, because if I think about this, I could probably come up with a bunch of these. Yeah, it's going uh, very well. I'm just. Um, yeah, that might be. If we do one more session, then I'll have something to work with. Right. I'll sure. Have Okay, are we running out of time here? Again? I think in a couple of minutes or three. Four. Yeah. So let's see. Uh, How about uh, let's maybe try to do some more of these? Like here's mimicking the natural food chain. How would where does that come up uh, in your figuring okay. things mimicking out? Mimicking the natural food chain. 
Uh, that 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 definitely yeah I've I've got lots of, of things that comes back to sort of uh, looking at the little trout pond. Uh huh. Uh, the trout pond. Uh huh. Yeah, where I would I would and then dissecting the trout and finding snails in there, and you say okay, where are the snails living? Mm -hmm. They're living on certain plants that glow along the edge. And you say well. Maybe if instead of just a use hose, I introduce watercress, which floats on the surface and has a huge um, root structure that just goes down into the water. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it turns out the snails love that. So you grow a lot more snails. So mm -hmm. if you have more snails, you can get more trout out of the pond. Mm -hmm. So it was that kind of thing that you look and you, you would make an observation that you say, okay, now... How do we alter the environment to favor more snails? Mm -hmm. yeah. And what what this is doing? It's these kind of micro these kind of molecular, biological, biochemical ideas I'm learning about, like how my molecules like act as catalysts and how these processes. See, you're basically your mind is working that way. You see, that's yeah. very interesting. To um, I mean, I think like so, if we map out your mind, we'll start to see like the logic of the spirit of biology, I think, I'm hoping. That's yeah. what I mean. Um, how about, um, well, combining challenges or problems or tasks such as water purification and underutilized biomass? You know, you tend to see your, you throwing things together into the soup, right? Um, well, that, that comes, uh, the big example there is, is you look at uh, what people consider to be waste streams. Mm, mm -hmm. And and the notion of uh, our waste waste streams are nature doesn't produce any waste because everything is recycled. So mm -hmm. if something is a waste stream. What's uh, what might eat that? Mm -hmm. So if if you've got like a, a distillery where you've got the distillage after you've uh, fermented and you boiled off the alcohol or what have you, and then how do you dispose of that? It's normally a problem. Uh, because it costs you money, otherwise you're polluting water. You're you're polluting water, and you need mm -hmm. to resolve that. You say, well, bacteria would eat that, and then uh, that becomes interesting because that's the start of a new food chain. So you've got and that's some... example of mimicking the natural food chain. How you're, yeah, yeah. And... So so you say, how do we we grow organisms on this, which we then can feed to fish which would normally live in the um, the environment. They could be crayfish, they could be mm -hmm. all kinds of things like that. So there's, yeah, there's, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I'm a Patreon supporter for Math for Wisdom because Andres and I have been friends for a long time, most of our lives. And the conversations I've had with him over the years have been very useful for me. Uh, he's also a big big fan, my supporter you know, of my work. And um, we just, we have deep conversations about math and physics that have been useful for charting the course of my interests. And, you know, I'm just, I'm grateful and, you know, I, I want to support that and, you know, our weekly or bi, you know, semi-weekly or bi-weekly conversations have been, have been um, very important for me in the last couple of years, especially. So, yeah, that's why I'm a supporter.